Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got exiled and unlocked a power to change the galaxy. Part 2. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Land of Iron, Roof is 6 Kage Summit Building. After Nikesti was done dispatching the Tsuchikage, Raikage, and Mifune, he ordered HK, Tayuya and Karen to carry the stun guards of the dead Kage, including Sakura. Nikesti and Ko then made their way to the roof, making sure to mind trick any samurai they came across. When they finally made it to the roof Nikesti calmed for an Imperial Assault shuttle to pick them up. Nikesti when is this transport you called for supposed to arrive? Tsunade asked. Look up Nikesti said while pointing up. When Tsunade looked up she didn't see anything, she was about to point out that there wasn't anything there when some kind of flying object landed on the roof of the Six Kage Summit building, making the wood roof groin in protest. What is that? Tsunade screamed while pointing at the Imperial Assault Shuttle. Our ride out of here Nikesti said from inside the shuttle. Tsunade really had no other choice but to board the shuttle as she'd like to fight an army of murderous samurai. Once Tsunade was strapped into a seat, the shuttle's cloaking device activated and lifted the shuttle off the building's roof and shot into the sky. Pride of the Sith Nikesti's private hangar. Once the shuttle docked with Pride of the Sith Nikesti ordered HK-47 to take Tsunade to his quarters and Dark Chidi to take all the captured bodyguards to Karen's lab and to use the force to keep them unconscious. With Tsunade and the captured bodyguards out of the way Nikesti, Tayuya, and Karen made their way to the bridge to access the situation with the power readings from the moon. Pride of the Sith Bridge. The atmosphere of the Pride's bridge was already tense, and it only got tenser when Nikesti walked into the bridge. Nikesti couldn't help but to crack a smile when he felt the bridge's crew fear. And who said fear wasn't a good motivator Nikesti thought while he walked to his throne in the center of the bridge. Skyray status report Nikesti barked. Skyray steeled herself and walked over to Nikesti's throne and kneeled. My lord so far nothing has changed, but the energy reading seemed to be lowering at a steady pace. Also earlier scans indicated that the moon was not capable of sustaining life, but recent scans for life have revealed that on the inside of the crust near the center three life forms have pooped up. The Redeed reported. 3. The only one living beings that should be inside the moon are Kagaya and the Juubi. This will require further looking into but for now. Nikesti thought. Skyray have the revolution and Harbinger send its H. Carry Khan units onto the moon and have them look for this symbol. Nikesti handed Skyray a portable holo projector and stood up from his throne and walked out of the bridge with Karen and Tayuya close behind. He heard Skyray's faint yes my lord. Nikesti's quarters. The three Sith lords walked into Nikesti's quarters and were met with an unexpected sight. HK-47 was sitting down in front of Tsunade, and he seemed to be questioning the buxom blonde of the many ways chakra could be used to kill a person. Query. Could this chakra be used to say peel the skin off of a meat bag? HK-47 asked. Tsunade was reluctantly going to answer when the sound of the door sliding open alerted her of Nikesti's arrival. Nikesti looked at the two in amusement HK I believe you need to get back to training the Mandalorians. Ejected statement. Master I had so many more questions about this chakra and how it can be used on meatbags. HK-47 said in a dejected tone. Nikesti chuckled at his assassination droid you'll have countless chances to ask about the uses of chakra when we're back on the Star Forge. Joyous statement. Thank you master, I will get back to training the Mandalorians. HK-47 said before walking out of the room. Nikesti walked over to his throne and sat down, Tayuya and Karen materialized a throne similar to Nikesti's and also sat down. Nikesti then used the force to pull a chair in front of his, Tayuya, and Karen's thrones for Tsunade to sit in. Once Tsunade is seated Nikesti begins to speak, you wanted to ask some questions about what happened to me over the years since I've been banished correct? Tsunade nodded not trusting her voice, she hoped that a little of the hyperactive blonde was still in Nikesti. Well as soon as I left the village I set out for the land of snow, but five days later when I was nearing the border of fire country I was approached by Rudanbu, who demanded that I return to the village to likely be brainwashed by Danzu. Remembering what old man third said to me about Danzu and not wanting to lose my newfound freedom, I created several shadow clones and throw down some smoke bombs and made a run for it using the shadow clones to distract the Anbu. The root Anbu destroyed the clones faster than I thought they would, and they cornered me on a cliff. In a last-ditch effort I jumped off the cliff. The Kesti let Tsunade digest what he said before continuing after dragging myself out of the river at the bottom of the riven I dragged my broken body into a clearing. I noticed that I was facing the very same cliff wall that I had just jumped off of. At this point I begging to get angry, and my anger gave me the strength to move, the root Anbu chose this moment to find me. 
they threatened to cause even more bodily harm to me, then bring me back to Danzu I became really pissed and began to hear dark whispers in the back of my mind, telling me to give in to my anger, which is exactly what I did. With the power that my anger gave me I tapped into the force and the voices became even louder, although this time they told me to destroy those fools. I unleashed a powerful burst of force lightning that turned the Anbu into smears on the trees. After that to make things short I met my first master Darth Hidzuska, a former emperor and formidable combatant, and received training from him and a few others. Ten hours later, pride of the Sith war room. It took Nikesti ten hours to tell Tsunade what happened over the four plus years, minus a lot of stuff that he deemed classified. Once she was caught up Nikesti sent her to a shuttle to be taken to Corbin Sith Academy for training. With Tsunade off of the ship Nikesti, Tayuya and Karen returned to the pride of the Sith bridge. Morning breaking of the fourth wall. The Kesti was once again sitting on his throne overlooking the bridge crew work while he while he was having a mental conversation with the author. What do you plan to have me do to Kanoha KNG? Nikesti asked. Honestly I don't know I have so many ways to sneak into Kanoha and kill the civilian council, but that wouldn't be any fun, maybe bring the pride planet side and have your forces jetpack down and cause anarchy in the village. Or you could land the pride just outside of Kanoha and deploy the Rakuten Annihilators and Rakuten Walkers to raise the Land of Fire's capital but it's up to you honestly. KNG said before cutting the connection. Breaking of the fourth well over. The Kesti stood up from his throne having decided how he was going to teach Kanoha not to fuck with the Dark Lord of the Sith. Skyl Ray activate the cloaking devices and bring us planet side to the coordinates that have been set in the Navi computer. Yes my lord was the response the Kesti got. To the rest of the fleet the pride vanished, but they knew that its cloaking device was activated, plus the Dark GD could still feel their emperor in the force. Skyray was barking orders at the bridge crew who were working overtime to please their emperor who they thought was still in a bad mood. Ibanez IV, Land of Fire, Kanoha, Pride of the Sith, Bottom Hanger. The Pride of the Sith was parked about 200 meters above Kanoha still cloaked. Nikesti wasn't going to start the attack until his allies were out of the village, this is why Nikesti was standing in front of the ray shielding that prevented the ship's atmosphere from being sucked out while in space with Revan's helmet under his arm. The Kesti switched back to his now black Neo Crusader armor with a new addition, a black cape with the Reborn Empire's insignia in the center. The Kesti put Revan's helmet on and wrapped a force around himself cloaking himself from unsuspecting eyes. When he was fully cloaked he took 20 steps back before launching forward in a burst of speed and jumping through the ray shield. The Kesti soared through the sky, flipping in midair so that his stomach was facing the ground and began to freefall toward the unforgiving ground. 100 meters. 90 meters, 60 meters, 30 meters, now. Nikesti thought. The rockets in his boots flared to life propelling the blonde forward. He flew through Kanoha's empty streets at over 150 miles per hour until he reached the gates to the Hyuga clan compound, which oddly had no one guarding said gates. Nikesti flew over the gates while dropping the force cloak reviling himself to the Hugh gas that were all gathered in front of the main branch's mansion. Standing on the roof of the main branch's mansion was Hinata Hyuga, Hinata didn't change much in the face department, aside from her kind and caring eyes being replaced by the eyes of a predator. She now stood at around 5'9", and wore a red and black version of Satel Shan's attire, photo on my deviantered page, she had two lightsabers strapped to her hips and a tattoo of the reborn insignia on her arm. Pleasantries can wait Heim we don't have much time. I need you to get you and some other people out of the village before I start the attack. Nikesti explained getting a pout from the Hyuga clan head, Hinata killed her father to complete her training as a Sith. Hinata walked over to the edge of the mansions and yelled kick you miserable asses into high gear and get to the underground passages we have a flight to catch. The Hyugas charged into the main branch mansion, down its stairs, into its basement, and down the ladder in the center of the basement. Hinata was the last person down the ladder and the last person on the shuttle. Nine hours later, pride of the Sith, bottom hanger. After leaving the Hyuga compound Nikesti went to the Nara and Aburami, along with Tenten's apartment, he was going to go to Guy and Lee's shared apartment, but then he thought if those two were to join the reborn ranks, then Nikesti didn't even want to think of what could and would happen if he brought them along. Nikesti once again stood in the pride of the Sith bottom hangar, but this time he had an assault GROUP 70,000 soldiers, which consisted of 30,000 Imperial Heavy Infantry, 20,000 Dark GD, and 20,000 of Death Legion's heavy assault units, 70,000 men and women in total stood before Nikesti ready for war. Behind the assault group engineers and pilots were running around preping the racket and annihilators and racket and walkers for the assault on the capital of the Land of Fire. The Kesti activated the hangar's speaker system Shujio Sistranita Wariatina and Rai Ermi Iwat Sisayuso. Naj Sistranita Kihatudi Atizarini Oi Tudi Ramurasiasi and Rai Rasuchajis. 
Tu hu sistranita tuti woi rai der sasa tuni oit kai tuti rai iuso tin reads a dot the consu nai just kihin insur si sisti ina rai tinat kai tuti nuri zo or si ersaja dia ani watintit kai juasai or shersigia. The kesti yelled in high sith, causing everyone in the hangar to cheer. Translation. Today this planet will fall to the reborn Sith Empire. While this planet may be primitive it is unknown to the Republic. Once this planet is under our control it shall be the Empire's true capital many of you might not survive this day, the Fallen shall be given a proper burial and their names engraved into history. The Kesti turned around so that he was facing the ray shielding, and once again yelled in high Sith Shujio mist kai tuti rumi i wa dias rai was rasasuda i was sistranita. Asamazi. Translation today we shall be reborn as the rulers of this planet. Charge. The members of the assault group charge past Nikesti jumping out of the ship and using the forcer jetpacks to safely land in Kanoha's red light district. Kanoha. It was still early in the morning so not many were out and about, the ones that were looked up to see the sky darkened by men and women dressed in weird looking armor. When the unknown people reached the ground all hell broke out. Ayuya, Kumo, Emperor's Blade Bottom Hanger. While Nikesti was preoccupied with Kanoha Tayuyu was tasked with capturing Kumo, Tayuyu had already deployed her troops and was watching the battle, waiting for the perfect moment to join the battle. She found that moment when a black laser hit the Emperor's blade, causing it to shake almost causing Tayuyu to lose her footing, but the shields held strong and the ship suffered no hull damage. Tayuyu reached out in the force to find the unlucky bastard that shot a laser at her ship, when she found him she jumped through the ray shield and free fell toward the soon-to-be-dead Kumo Nin. Baron, Iwa, Cipher Alpha, Karen's lab. Baron's lab was set up just like the one on Nikesti's ship just a lot bigger. Karen was currently tasked with either destroying or capturing Iwa. While she did have a Mandalorian army she didn't feel like wasting her time with an all-out assault, so she dispatched her Cipher agents and Sith assassins to kill off the village's remaining leaders and kidnap the village's clan heirs and heiress, since she wanted to experiment on them and try to replicate their bloodline for the Royal Guard to use. While Karen was tracking the progress of her assassins and agents, she was more interested with the Sith spawn she was creating from a newborn rancor to give to Nikesti as a birthday present. The rancor as it was was only 15 meters inches and it was locked behind a large ray shielded containment cell. Karen was meditating in front of the cell, ironing out the last of the minor details of the soon-to-be Sith spawn's battle capabilities, neurotoxic laced claws that only a select few are immune to, lightsaber resistant skin, extreme resistance to turbo lasers, improved speed, strength and intelligence, force resistance, ability to absorb its victim's knowledge and send it to its master. Ability to breath fire, lava resistant skin, increased size from 15 meters to 60 meters, 196 feet, ability to breath on land and air, and modified memories to make a tink Nikesti, me and Tayu you are its parents. Karen thought to herself before she began the ritual. Baron began to chant in high Sith, most of the chant I had planned wouldn't translate so you sorry, dark tendrils of dark side infused smoke seeped into the cell and began to enter the rancor through its eyes, nose, and mouth. The rancor began to slam its head into the ray shield until Karen grabbed it with a force and rooted in place while the smoke did its work in mutating the beast. The first noticeable changes were the rancor growing to 20 meters and its claws began to drip what Karen assumed was the neurotoxin meaning stage 1 was complete. Stage 2 would begin in about 30 seconds, Karen knew that the cell wouldn't hold the beast when it reached full height, she pressed a button on a remote she fished out of her pocket. The floor under the cell opened up reviling that the Cipher Alpha was parked over the center of Iowa, and the cell's ray shield was deactivated, and the now-growing Sithspin was dropped into the center of Iowa, kicking up a large cloud of dust and crushing a few buildings. Iowa, village center, midday. When the dust cloud cleared the crowd of ninja and civilians that gather around the cloud out of curiosity, Toka stepped back in fear at what they saw. In the place of the cloud was a pitch black monster that towered over even the Tsuchikage's tower, right now the rancor is only 35 meters in height, its claw tipped fingers were easily half the size of the Tsuchikage's tower and were dripping a deadly looking red poison. The monster's face was flat and dominated by a mouth that was full of jagged razor sharp teeth and had two large beady eyes that showed more intelligence than one would assume a monster such as this one was capable of. The monster let out a fear-inducing roar that caused the civilians to panic and run away, while the ninja began to attack the monster with jutsus, only for them to hit the monster and shatter against its hard skin, or simply do nothing at all other than anger the monster who let out another roar and began to spew a stream of pitch-black fire out of its mouth. The stream of fire incinerated everything and anyone that it touched. Some of the surviving ninja pulled out swords and ran at the monster, while the rest drew kunai and shuriken all of them letting out a battle cry, only for those battle cries to turn into screams of horror and shock when their weapons shattered when they made contact with its skin. The ninja noticed noticed that a large shadow had engulfed them. 
When they looked up they saw that the source of the shadow was the monster's massive foot. They didn't even get a chance to run as the massive foot reduced them to mere smears of blood on its foot. The beast took notice to the large amount of humans running toward the village's wall, know that its mother wouldn't be pleased with it if it let them escape it got on all fours and became a blur to even the trained eye and appeared on the other side of the wall, only to be hit head on by a five-tailed white dolphin HORSE Kakyo hybrid, sending the monster flying into a monstrous left hook from a Redford green skin four-tailed M-O-N-K-E-Y Son Goku with the build of a gorilla that sent it flying into a mountain. Son Goku shot a large glob of lava, while Kakuo blew a cloud of steam at what they knew was a rancor turned Sithspin. When the lava and steam hit the Sithspin that was getting up from the left hook it received it sent the Sithspin back into the mountain, making a large cloud of dust and smoke. When the dust and smoke cleared the two by just paled at what they saw, the Sithspin was now 60 meters tall, had two large tusks jetting out of its mouth, and it was pissed. Playing with you too was fun, but mother wants that village destroyed with no survivors. So I lend this quick the Sithspin said in a dark voice causing to two Biju to shoot a combined Biju Dama at the Sithspin, who laughed and backhanded the Biju Dama toward Iwa. After the Biju Dama detonated in the place of Iwa and everything 70 miles in each direction was a crater. Son Goku and Kakuo looked at the crater that used to be Iwa in horror. With the two distracted the Sith spawn appeared behind them and effortlessly picked the two Biju up in its large hands and placed them in its mouth and with one swift bite, the Biju were no more and their memories were collected. The Sithspin quickly devoured the other half of the Biju when it felt its mother approaching its location. Perrin, Sifer Alpha, Bridge. Perrin was observing the progress of her creation from her flagship's bridge. To say that she was surprised when it spoke would be an understatement, she never expected for it to gain the ability to speak, but that just meant that her present was better than Tayuya's by leaps and bounds. Perrin ordered the crew of the bridge to move the Sifer to the location of her creation and left the bridge heading to her lab to contact Nikesti. Nikesti, Kanoha, Village Square. Nikesti was surrounded by 30 Anbu, who all had their tantos drawn and poised to strike, if the unknown man even moved an inch. You are surrounded and outclassed surrender, and we may spare your life the lead Anbu said arrogance practically dripping from his mouth. Nikesti chuckled while he removed his lightsaber from his hip and depressed the activation nub I should be saying that to you. But that said Nikesti was in front of the lead Anbu, with his lightsaber sticking out of the man's back killing him instantly. Angered by the death of their comrade they converged on Nikesti, hoping to overwhelm him with their numbers. Nikesti ducked under a slash that would have decapitated him and blasted the perpetrator with Sith lightning, reducing the man to ashes, then jumped over another slash that was aimed at his legs and retaliated by delivering a drop kick to the nearest Anbu, causing the woman's chest to cave in. Nikesti caught a punch that would have hit the visor of his helmet and ripped the offending limb from the sender's shoulder and used it like a club and hit the Anbu that was charging at him from his left in the neck. The force of the hit and the speed the man gained from charging at Nikesti caused his neck to snap with a loud crack. Nikesti grew bored of killing the Anbu who had yet to even hit him and created a spear of pressure around the remaining Anbu's heads and increased the pressure causing their heads to explode, sending blood, gore, and brain matter everywhere. Nikesti's comlink beeped alerting him that either Ta Yu or Karen had completed their assignments. Not wanting to be attacked while he was on his comlink Nikesti's rockets flared to life and him shot into the sky, once he was high enough in the air he turned on his comlink. Nikesti was surrounded by 30 Anbu, who all had their tantos drawn and poised to strike, if the unknown man even moved an inch. You are surrounded and outclassed surrender, and we may spare your life the lead Anbu said arrogance practically dripping from his mouth. Nikesti chuckled while he removed his lightsaber from his hip and depressed the activation nub, I should be saying that to you. But that said Nikesti was in front of the lead Anbu, with his lightsaber sticking out of the man's back killing him instantly. Angered by the death of their comrade they converged on Nikesti, hoping to overwhelm him with their numbers. Nikesti ducked under a slash that would have decapitated him and blasted the perpetrator with Sith lightning, reducing the man to ashes, then jumped over another slash that was aimed at his legs and retaliated by delivering a drop kick to the nearest Anbu, causing the woman's chest to cave in. Nikesti caught a punch that would have hit the visor of his helmet and ripped the offending limb from the sender's shoulder and used it like a club and hit the Anbu that was charging at him from his left in the neck. The force of the hit and the speed the man gained from charging at Nikesti caused his neck to snap with a loud crack. Nikesti grew bored of killing the Anbu who had yet to even hit him and created a spear of pressure around the remaining Anbu's heads and increased the pressure causing their heads to explode, sending blood, gore, and brain matter everywhere. Nikesti's comlink beeped alerting him that either Ta Yu Yu or Karen had completed their assignments. Not wanting to be attacked while he was on his comlink Nikesti's rockets flared to life and him shot into the sky, once he was high enough in the air he turned on his comlink. Nikesti, Kanoha. 
Baron's holographic form appeared on Nikesti's comlink looking happier than normal report Nikesti commanded. Baron nodded the destruction of Iowa is complete and the capture of the village's clan heirs and heiress was a success. Also I'm sending the footage of the attack via your helmet's video feed. Karen reported while sending Nikesti the footage. Nikesti watched the footage of the Sith's been destroying Iowa and killing Son Goku and Kakyo. Saying he was impressed would be an understatement, he was more than impressed, he was amazed at the sheer destruction the Sith's been caused. Nikesti's was going a million light years a second thinking of the many ways it could be used. But as amazed as he was with Karen's creation one question was on his mind why, why would she go through the trouble of making a Sith spin just to destroy one primitive village, Nikesti's mind was trying to think of a good reason why she made the Sith spin and couldn't think of one, well that was until he heard what Karen said next it is. Happy birthday Naruto-kun. I hope you like your present Karen said stopping Nikesti's train of thought. Nikesti laughed at the irony of this it's fitting that the destruction of Kanoha would take place on my birthday Nikesti thought. Thank you Karen, now go to AIM, Hidden Rain Village and the main base for the Akasuki. Nikesti said and cut the transmission. Nikesti looked down at the village his army was currently bringing hell upon, although they were taking their sweet time doing so, and Nikesti was bored of cutting down the village's ninja and anbu, and aboard Nikesti was a destructive Nikesti. Blood red and black lightning crackled around Nikesti's hands before shooting into the sky, piercing the clouds and forming a large dome around the village. Down in the village. When the dome of lightning formed all fighting stopped and Sith, Mandalorian, Imperials and Revanites all began to panic since they've seen firsthand what Nikesti intended to do and the lack of remorse their emperor held when things were taking too long in his mind. Nikesti's evil laughter could be heard by everyone in the village, and his ice-cold voice all are under the banner of the reborn Sith, you have two minutes to get back to the pride of the Sithless you want to be killed. Everyone in Nikesti's assault group stopped what they were doing and either used their jetpacks or the force to get to the pride of the Sith. Once the two minutes passed lightning began to rain down from the sky, striking the village reducing everything and anyone into atoms. After a full ten minutes of lightning striking the village, the only thing left standing was the Hokage Tower. But Nikesti didn't allow it to exist for more than a few seconds before he drained the life force of every living being inside of the building and used a force push to send the Hokage Tower into the Hokage Monument. When the building hit the monument the fourth Hokage's face crumbled reviling the civilizations and ninja that took up refuge inside of the monument. Instead of killing the survivors Nikesti ordered Skyray to send down a few shuttles and capture all of the survivors, have them sorted out by how strong their connection to the forces, before shipping all of them to Korriban for training or to be killed. But that handled Nikesti flew back to the pride of the Sith's bottom hangar, where he was greeted with cheers and celebration between the assault group members. Nikesti shook his head and set a course for his chambers to relax before Tayuyu calmed him to brag about how easy it was for her to desecrate Kumo. Kumo. To the villagers of Kumo the attack happened so fast, first a strange flying ship and of metal appeared out of nowhere, and hundreds of thousands of oddly dressed men and women descended from the ship with blades of light and metal contraptions that shot red-colored lasers. Then the slaughters happened the ninja fired off lightning jutsu after lightning jutsu at the attackers, but they did nothing, and the battle quickly became very one-sided. When the villagers thought the worse had come even more men and women descended from the ship, these men and women's armor were covered in flames, then the fires started the flame-covered men, and women held weapons that spewed forth unforgiving waves of black flames. The villager while they were panicking they were all cursing their kage for not being there to protect them. They think he's still at the summit. At this time ninja and villager were losing hope by the second, the streets were covered in burned and hold filled bodies, and the buildings weren't faring any better, most were on fire, and the rest were nearing collapse. All in all the village was fucked. But Tayuya, just outside of Kumo. Tayuya was free falling toward the location that she felt the laser come from. With her advanced sight she could see the one who sent the laser at her flagship, he was a fairly tall, dark-skinned man with a slightly bulbous nose, black eyes with bored look plastered on his face, and shaggy, white hair which covers his left eye. He wore a high-collared, sleeveless uniform with loose-fitting pants, bandages on his wrists, and the one strap over one shoulder flak jacket of a Kumagakur shinobi. He also had stylized characters for water, for, and lightning divided by tattooed on his right and left shoulders respectively, likely denoting his chakra's nature affinities, water release and lightning release. Ah you you know exactly who this was Karen had a large profile on him. Dairy student of the third Raikage. During his training he learned the Raikage's unique black lightning technique. Dairy was one of the targets Karen wanted for her experiments, which meant Karen would bitch to her for a month if she killed him. When Tayuya was nearing the ground she righted herself midair and crashed into the ground with the force of a nuke. The force of her landing caused a crater that spanned 5 meters, 16 feet wide 5 meters deep, and kicked up a large cloud of dust. 
Not waiting for the dust cloud to clear Ta Yuyu sent a torrent of red lightning at Derry, only for him to dodge and draw his sword and charged into the dust cloud. Feeling Derry charging at her Ta Yuyu unclasped her lightsabers from her belt and depressed the activation nub, igniting the red and black blade, Ta Yuyu charged at Derry meeting him halfway. Derry attempted a downward slash only for his blade to be cut into three pieces and got his left hand cut off for his trouble. Derry quickly abandoned the offensive and began dodging the redhead's relentless lashes and jumped back a good 7 meters, 22 feet, to get away from the woman. When his feet hit the ground Derry felt himself being pushed by an invisible force and was sent flying through a boulder before the same force pulled him back toward the woman who delivered a devastating armor-clad punch to his jaw which shattered his jaw. Derry cried out in pain as the force of the punch sent him flying backwards toward the boulder that he was sent through. Ayuya phased out of existence in a burst of speed and appeared behind Derry and sent him flying into the air with a kick to his already shattered jaw. Tayuya disappeared again and dropped kick the still ascending Derry, halting his ascent and sending him flying over the village gates. Before Derry could completely pass over the walls Tayuya once again appeared over him and curb stomped him to the village walls. Tayuya gracefully landed on the village wall and walked over to the spot where Derry laid prone barely breathing and unconscious. She briefly wondered if she should have held back a little more before laughing. Ah Yu Yu grabbed Derry's leg and began dragging him to the assault shuttle which had recently landed near the area where the one-sided fight began. She made sure to take the bumpiest and rock-filled path, adding head trauma to the long list of injuries she had already given him. Karen never did say he didn't have to be beaten near teeth the redhead thought as she entered the shuttle. Kumo, five minutes after Ta Yu Yu's fight with Derry. While Ta Yuyu was beating Derry near death, the entirety of her assault group had returned to the ship so they wouldn't get caught in Flame Legion's crossfire. With Flame Legion's arrival and the fires that followed them wherever they went, the remaining ninja of Kumo that weren't dead, injured, or running around on fire, had turned tail and ran toward the mountain that the Raikage Tower was built into thinking that it would save them from Flame Legion. Flame Legion's Field Marshal Mai Se watched impassively as her legion lit the buildings that were still standing ablaze. Mai stood at 5'6 with shoulder-length silver hair that was tied into a high ponytail. She proudly wore the flame-covered armor of Flame Legion, the thing that signified her as a field marshal, was the reborn Sith insignia in the center of her armor's chest piece and the tattered and singed cape. Her face was covered by her helmet that had bad motherficker etched just above her visor. Mai turned her attention from her soldiers who were lighting the buildings on fire to her soldiers who had their flamethrowers trained on the base of the mountain, awaiting her command to burn their was into the mountain and incinerate the people that were hiding inside the mountain. Ready. Steady. Fire. Mai yelled in a slightly robotic voice due to her having her helmet on. Flames spewed out of the flamethrowers and met with the base of the mountain, causing the rock to melt into lava, which was cooled by one member of Flame Legion, who held a high-pressure hose, used to put out fires on a starship. After 20 minutes of melting their way into the mountain, they finally reached the large chamber that the villagers were hiding in. Mai casually walked into the chamber with her T-75T blaster rifle flamethrower pointed at the villagers Hello fuck wads welcome to hell my name is Mai, how may I reduce you all to ashes on this fine fiery day? Mai shouted voice full of pyromania. After she finished her statement her blaster let out a barrage of blaster bolts at the large group of people who began to panic and ran toward the entrance that they entered through only for a stray missile to explode in the front, the crowd creating a large wall of flames blocking the entrance. The cuckoo escape isn't an option now be good charcoal and burn, Mai said as she threw a fire grenade in the center of the crowd. The fire grenade began to spew out flames in all directions, lighting the people closest to it on fire, and they in turn lit the others on fire while they ran around trying to put themselves out. They never saw the same guy who had the hose cover them in gas before lobbing a regular grenade into the crowd blowing up a few people and igniting the gas. Their screams of pain were music to Flame Legion's ears as they echoed throughout the chamber. Mai ordered some of her soldiers to place nukes around the chamber away from the flames and to put flame retardant foam in the path of the fire to prevent the nukes from prematurely detonating while they were still within the blast radius. Once the nukes were set and the fire blocked off from the nukes, Mai called for Flame Legion to return to the Emperor's Blade with haste. Ten minutes later Emperor's Blade. It took ten minutes for the entirety of Flame Legion to return to the Emperor's Blade. Once Mai was sure that everyone was accounted for she made a beeline for the bridge where she was sure Ta Yuyu was. Bridge. Ta Yuyu was standing next to a Togruta woman of average HEIGHT54, looking at night sky, waiting for Mai to return and give her report before Ta Yuyu in turn gave her report to Nikesti. The woman's skin was a pale red borderline pink, dark side corruption. Her leku, head tails. Look up a picture of Shakti to understand what a Tigrita's leku looked like, were predominantly black with some strips of red on the upper part of her leku. 
She wore an all-red version of the Grand Admiral uniform, with a GSI 24D disruptor pistol attached to her hip and a lightsaber on her other hip. Mai's footsteps alerted the two women of her presence, when the two turned around Mai gave them a salute before giving her report to Ta Yuya and informed the two about the nukes that she had placed in the chamber, where the now-burnt remains of Kumo survivors resided. The Tegruta began to bark orders to the bridge crew to get the ship out of the blast radius, an estimated fallout zone once Mai had finished her giving her report. Once the Emperor's blade was a safe distance from what remained of Kumo Mai detonated the nukes, causing a large mushroom cloud that could likely be seen from Kiri. With the amount of nukes Mai had placed the majority of Kaminari no Kuni, Land of Lightning, was uninhabitable due to the fallout. Ayuya didn't see nor did she care about seeing her field marshal nuke a village she need to give her report to her cousins so that she could get back to the war they were wagging in the unknown regions. Tayuyu walked out of the bridge and made a beeline for her personal quarters. Emperor's Blade Tayuyu's personal quarters. Tayuyu's quarters were well for a lack of better words, looked like hell had a spice baby with a graveyard. The room was massive, the walls and floor was glass, except for a small path that led up to a large throne made out of skulls and blades, and a bed large enough to fit five people comfortably. Behind and under the glass walls and floors was lava, and what looked like ten baby fireworms or lava dragons as most people called them, the lava dragons were only five meters, sixteen feet, long, with black crystalline scales that protected them from the lava that they dwelled within. The room was dully lit by thirty torches that lined the glass walls. When Tayuya entered her quarters and sat on her throne then pressed a button on the armrest. When she pressed the button the floor parted and the lava dragons shoot up out of the lava, waiting for their master to feed them. Tayuya pressed another button, ten large rodents twice the size of Nikesti were released from their cages into the lava. Sensing the rodents the lava dragons dived into lava splashing lava all over the room, which Tayuya used the force to redirect back into the lava before closing the floor, then walking over to the hala terminal and contacting Nikesti. Bride of the Sith Nikesti's Chambers. Nikesti barely repressed a sigh after hearing Tayuyu's report, so you allowed Mai to nuke an entire village. Yup. Rendering the entire country uninhabitable. Yup. And you didn't think to stop her. Nope. And you call this a success. Yes. Nikesti deadpanned at his slightly older cousin's indifferent attitude, and her use of only three letter words to answers I'm not sure if I should punish her, congratulate her, or say fuck it and take a nap to avoid the headache Nikesti thought while rubbing his temples. Nikesti choose to just give her next set of orders and go take a nap meet Karen in orbit so that we can eliminate the Akasuki and be done with this planet and return to the front lines. Nikesti shut off the holo terminal and belly flopped onto his bed where he passed out. One day and 23 hours later. Nikesti's eyes snapped open when he felt another body on top of his. He tried to move only to find out that whoever was on top of him had their arms wrapped around his body. Nikesti already knew who was using him as a full body pillow, since this was a common occurrence for him. Why does she insist on using me as a full body pillow? Nikesti thought before he sent currents of electricity through his body and into the person's body electrocuting them and causing them to shot up into the air and onto the floor spasming uncontrollably. Nikesti got off his bed and looked at the still spasming figure on the ground. Karen get the fuck up I know that that wasn't enough voltage to cause you to spasm and stop sneaking into my bed while I sleep. Nikesti yelled while delivering a kick to her ribs which sent the now identified Karen flying across the chambers and into the wall where she fell into a heap while laughing. Karen might be a little insane. Nikesti shook his head at Karen's. Being um Karen. I'm surrounded by idiots he thought while trying to nurse the headache he was trying to escape from. 45 minutes later, bridge. We now find out blonde emperor sitting on his throne with Karen, who was acting sane for the time being, to his right, and the holographic form of Tayuya to his right. To the ones who couldn't use the force the two dark council members and emperor were just citing her standing depends on who we're talking about, they're unmoving, but to a trained user of the force they were currently in a mind link. Mind link. Sending our troops into aim would be sending them to their deaths, pain would make short work of them. Then there's the rest of the still living Akasuki members, we would only be sending out armies to their deaths, and let's not forget to take into account that once word gets out about the elite and most decorated legions being decimated by primitive people on a primitive planet, the moral of our empire would suffer a heavy decline. Nikesti said though the mental link although it was more so directed toward Tayuya, who suggested a full-scale invasion. Tayuya remained silent. Let's not also forget that your legion would be the least effective in this scenario, since it's always raining a name, even if you did manage to light something on fire, either the shinobi will out out the fire pain, will make it rain even harder once again putting out the fires. Naruto's death legion would be the most qualified for a full out assault, since they are the most versatile legion we have with us at the moment. Karen said butting in. Okay then what was your plan then? 
Tayuya asked pissed that everything they said thus far was true. She may be stubborn, but even she could see the logic behind his sister and cousin's thoughts. I propose the fun way that will decrease the amount of time we are wasting on this planet when we could be back on the front lines where we belong. My plan is simple orbital bombardment, then we cast the dark world ritual on the planet and leave the rest to the Kagis Nikesti explained, getting an evil smirk from Tayuya and an insane grin from Karen. The dark world ritual is a Sith ritual that infuses a planet with the dark side of the force. When the Sith conquer a world they are to use this ritual to infuse it with the dark side of the force, thus permanently aligning that planet with the dark side. This ritual is a means to ensure that the Republic and the Jedi can never reclaim the planet that Sith have conquered. This technique requires 15 powerful Sith Lords to infuse the planet with Dark Side of the Force. This technique is a very delicate one that requires the user's complete focus, because one mistake can result in the destruction of the planet that the ritual is being performed on, in fact it is for this reason why the Jedi don't interfere with the ritual once it begins. Created by the Sithari. Each of you create five clones and send them to Kiri, then have them prepare for the ritual, and I'll do the same. Nikesti commanded while creating five shadow clones and infusing them with the dark side. Once his clones were competently infused with the dark side he set them on their way, along with Karen's dark side infused clones. Real world. Nikesti called over Skyray who dropped whatever she was doing and rushed over to his throne kneeling. Order the Tyrant, Apocalypse, Vanguard, Defiant, the Leviathan, Eternity and Immortal to commence full-scale bombardment of the coordinates labeled Ami. Also make sure they know that failure is not an option. Nikesti commanded. Skyle Ray saluted Nikesti and went to one of the holo terminals won the bridge to contact the admirals of the ships chosen by her emperor. Nikesti watched Skyle Ray as she walked to do as she was told. He stood from his throne, stretched a little, and walked off the bridge toward the turbolift that led directly to his personal hangar. Nikesti's personal hangar. Nikesti, Tayuya, and Karen's flagships had a personal hangar that only their field marshals and admirals knew about. The hangar also wasn't on the schematics for their ships to avoid any possible sabotage to their personal starships and give them an escape route should their flagships go under. The hangar had 14 ships docked in it, but the only two that mattered right now was Nikesti's Fire Spray 31 class patrol and attack craft Sadatazi W apostrophe ANA apostrophe Dreadful Star same type of starship slave I and his Sith Meditation Sphere Deja's Wana, Beautiful Star. Sadatazi Wana was painted a darkish red and black, like all fire sprays, Sadatazi Wana sat flat on its bottom surface when idle, although during flight the ship rotated 90 degrees to maneuver vertically. Nikesti did add it a unique stabilization system which always kept the beep pit oriented up. Sadatazi Wana was heavily armed, her armament included two heavy twin blaster cannons, two rapid-firing laser cannons, one Minlayer, two AASL proton torpedo launchers, one homing beacon launcher, and one F-1 tractor beam projector. Most of her weapons were hidden minus the heavy twin blaster cannons and rapid-firing laser cannons. She also had a cloaking device, decoy system, sensor mask and jamming systems, and static discharge port as countermeasures. Asia's Wana was a female program Sith meditation sphere, she had a round beep pit and resembled Yu's Vong creations, but she was inorganic and had a dark red-black color. Her main weapon shot large spheres at a target. Her interior was bare minus the place where the pilot sat in a meditative posture in the center of the beep pit and communicated mentally with her. Seeing as Deja's Wana was spacious enough to carry several people without any discomfort, Nikesti chose to use her to transport him and Karen to Yukigakura. Deja's Wana sensing her creator approaching her boarding ramp, extended allowing Nikesti and Karen to enter her. Nikesti went to the pilot's meditation area, while Karen went to a couch that Deja's Wana made appear when she sensed Karen enter behind Nikesti. Dejas take us to the citadel in Yukigakura. Nikesti mentally commanded. Yes my master Dejas Wana obediently replied. Dejas Wana's engines roared as she shot out of the hangar toward Yukigakura. If one were to look out of Dejas Wana's viewport they would have seen another meditation spear exit Emperor's blade. Itai Hidoki a 12-year-old boy was giddy about the telescope his parents had gotten him for his birthday earlier that day. Even though it was was always raining in aim he could still look at Payne's tower and hope that something interesting happened. After little Jataya set up his telescope so it was looking at Payne's tower and he looked through it, his retinas were melted by a bright flash of light that ripped through the tower, blinding him not that it matter, since his house was destroyed by another laser. Payne's tower, 15 minutes 30 seconds before its destruction. Payne or Nagato Yuzumaki one of the few surviving members of the Yuzumaki clan, you all know what he looks like, the nephew of Kashina, and was the lucky, or unlucky, bastard that was at the top of Nikesti's very long list of people that were going to die. Nagato was currently in a heated argument with his longtime friend Conan about her leaving Omegakur before his COUSI and apostrophe S Karen, Tayuya, and Akesti armies were at its doorstep. 
The Gato knew from the start when the Akasuki started hunting the Biju, and when he felt the Dark Sai choose his younger cousin as the Dark Lord of the Sith that his days were numbered, he broke his clan's oldest laws when he attempted to kill a fellow CLA and SME and Akesti. The Uzumaki clan's most guarded secret was their origins, the Uzumaki clan came from a long since destroyed planet whose name has been lost to the ages, even to the Uzumakis themselves. The Uzumakis were so heavily attuned to the dark side of the force that they could feed off of it to lengthen their lifespans much like the Anzadi. Let's get bad on subject. Nagato why can't you come with me? I can you lose you. Not after Yahiko. Conan yelled tears rolling down her normally stoic face. Nagato tried to calm Conan down by smiling but was awarded with a coughing fit for his effort. Cough. Cough you won't lose me Conan I'll always be with you even if you can't see me. I knew from the day we found out that Naruto Uzumaki cough. Or Darth Nikesti as he been titled was the container of the Nine Tails that I wouldn't live much longer. By hunting the Nine Tails I committed high treason, an offense that calls for the death of the one who has committed the crime. The Gato started coughing up blood. Seeing her only friend coughing up blood she tried to run and get his pills, but found that she couldn't move no matter how hard she tried. No let me suffer I deserve it after hunting down Aunt Kishina's only child cough. Cough. Wheeze. I should have attempted to kill Abito, he found out when he got Abito drunk, when I found out what he really planned. Honan kept trying to fight against a force that was preventing her from getting the pills that would help Nagato, even though he didn't want to take them. Seeing that Conan wasn't going to leave willingly, he used his limited knowledge of the force to put her into a force-induced sleep and pulled out a holocron, datapad, and recording device. On the datapad he wrote a letter to Nikesti begging him to look after Conan and another for Conan to read. The holocron needed no explanation. And with the recording device he recorded his life history and his final words to Conan and Nikesti. 30 seconds before the destruction of his tower. Once he finished he gathered a large amount of the force and sent toward Conan, teleporting her onto the steps of the citadel in Yukigakura, where she was discovered by Koyuki, and quickly rushed to the hangar that Nikesti would arrive in. Bugato smiled knowing the Conan wouldn't die with him. As quickly as his smile came it disappeared when he sensed Abito enter the room. Once Abito appeared out of the vortex Nagato was down to 15 seconds, acting quickly Nagato closed Abito's chakra pathways with the force and grabbed with the forces rooting him to where he was standing and ensuring that he would take Abito to the grave with him. The green laser ripped through the tower vaporizing Nagato who disappeared becoming a force ghost and Abito who, well just died. Of Nikesti, Yukigakura, Citadel Royal Hangar. Nikesti knew that Nagato would send Conan to him so that she wouldn't die with him. He may hate Nagato with a passion, but he had to give it to the man, he baffled Nikesti by sending the blue-haired woman to him. He didn't know if Nagato was a fool, or he thought that giving her to Nikesti that she would kill him in his sleep, or that he would look after the blue-haired woman. The second and third were the most logical reasons that Nagato would send Conan to him. Nikesti just then noticed the stuff that was in her hand, he turned on the recording device and cursed in high Sith, making Tayuyu proud and getting a sweat drop from everyone else in the hangar. Nagato basically called him out on his status as leader of the Uzumaki clan, if he denied the request it would look bad on his part, and if he did accept the request, then he would have to deal with another female that would make his life even more troublesome than it already was. The Kesti sighed and lashed out shooting pure black force lightning at the person closest to him, which unfortunately, for the victim, was one of Koyuki's guards. The guard was vaporized when the lightning hit him, which made Nikesti feel a lot better, but he was still pissed. Nikesti took a deep breath to calm himself down and vaporized another one of Koyuki's guards Koyuki take her to Karen's lab on my flagship and make sure she's properly restrained, Nikesti commanded getting a nod for the Kage. Nikesti teleported to the Citadel's lowest level which was 200 feet below sea level. Citadel's lowest level. The lowest level of the Citadel was deemed level minus 324 due to how deep underground it was. Level minus 324 was one large room, 300 times 300, that was dimly lit by randomly placed torches. The walls of the level were covered in Sith runes that were likely meant to help hasten the process of infusing a planet with the dark side. In the center of the room were the 14 clones Nikesti, Tayuya, and Karen created to prep the dark world ritual, meditating in a large and complete circle. In an explosion of the dark side that was followed by two others Nikesti, Tayuya, and Karen appeared in the large room. Not even sparing a second they completed the circle, and with a nod shared between all of them they began the ritual. Wisps of the dark side in its purest form seeped out of the clones and their creators, forming a large floating reddish-purple sphere that was floating just above the center of the circle, signifying that phase one of three had started. Fifteen hours later. In the fifteen hours that passed since the three humans and fourteen clones began the ritual the sphere of pure dark side energies had grown to the point where it looked like a small sun, at this point one could say that phase one was complete. 
feeling that they had gathered enough dark side energies, they willed the sphere to shoot a beam into the GROUND phase 2, to begin the process of turning the entire planet to the dark side. Ibanez IV. Ibanez IV's inhabitants whether they be animal or humans were changing, the animals were being mutated into feral sifspins which attacked any and everything that they could find. The humans of the planets felt themselves being corrupted and their thoughts becoming darker, as the dark side corrupted them making any and all chances of them ever aligning with the light side impossible. GD Temple, Council Chambers. Ever since Nikesti spoke to the council there was tension between them, although they did well to hit it from anyone who wasn't on the council. They were currently discussing GD shit when they felt another blast of the dark side, which knocked all of the council minus Yoda, who calmly sat in his seat. Once the council compassed themselves one of them asked Yoda what they felt. Turned a planet to dark side Darth Nikesti has. Yoda replied not worried at all. But how is that possible, I've never heard of any ritual that could change a planet's alignment Yaddle asked. One such ritual there is, lost to the ages I thought it was but wrong I have been. Yoda said already knowing what most of the council was going to do. The council went into an uproar, most saying that they should eliminate Darth Nikesti before he becomes even more of a threat, while other argued that they should try to reason with him. Yoda and Yaddle sighed at the council's behavior, they both walked out of the chambers unnoticed by the council. Ibanez IV, Yukigakura, level minus 324, three days later. Phase 2 took three days to complete due to how big Ibanez IV was and the massive amount of organic life on the planet. Phase 3 was them absorbing the leftover dark side energies inside of a small metal sphere that once opened after the energies were sealed inside would explode with the force of 25 nukes blowing up all at once. Pride of the Sith, Karen's lab, three hours later. The Kesti along with Ta Yuya and Karen were still tired from preforming the Dark World ritual, but they needed to handle Conan so that they could depart to Tathal Sector. Conan was chained to the far back wall of the now vacated lab the formerly belonged to Karen. The chains used to restrain her we covered in seals to prevent her from dispersing into paper and escaping, even though she wouldn't be able to get off the ship. The sharp hiss of the entrance to Karen's lab woke the blue-haired paper user. Nagato. She screamed and started thrashing around causing the chains to rattle. The sound of the chains rattling caused Conan to stop thrashing about and take her surroundings. The first thing she did was check to see if she still had her clothes on, she gave a sigh of relief at the fact that she was still dressed, but she was still on alert. Her eyes scanned the room she was in, to her it looked like one of Orochimaru's labs, minus the disfigured bodies of his failed experiments. She half expected to see the pale nuke nin somewhere in the room, but the sight she saw was ten times worse than the snake pedophile. In front of her stood the very person that the Akasuki hunted, flanked by two red heads she recognized as Tayuyu of the Sound for Orochimaru's personal bodyguards, said to have died during the kidnapping of Sasuke and Karen, the mad doctor former leader of one of Orochimaru's hideouts until about four years ago. Conan had always found it strange that Karen fell of the face of planet around the same time Naruto did when she asked Nagato about it, he said not to worry about it and that her disappearance didn't matter since she wouldn't affect their plans. She knew her longtime friend was hiding something from her and now she knew what he was hiding. She submersed that Nagato somehow knew that the QB Jinchuriki had somehow stolen her from the snake pedophile but hid it from the rest of the Akasuki. Conan once the thought of Nagato crossed her mind again she looked around the room hopping to see her crippled friend. The Kesti growing bored of the silence decided to break said silence Nagato is dead if that's the reason that you're looking around. You lie. Nagato isn't dead. He can't be. Conan screamed trashing around trying to break free of the chains that were preventing her from killing the bastard that killed Nagato. If he was then would you be chained up, if he was still alive, then would I and my cousins be standing in front of you right now wouldn't he? I killed the scum you call Nagato and watched the life drain from his eyes before I plucked them out of their sockets, Nikesti said, giving her a condescending smirk that infuriated the paper user. Give into your anger, use it to strike me down, Nikesti said, releasing a little bit of his corrupting force presence. Conan was livid it wasn't enough that he killed Nagato, but he also stole his eyes, this bastard needed to die, but she lacked the strength to break free of the chains. Give into your anger. Use it to kill the one that killed your loved one, a dark voice whispered in the back of her head. If she was in the right state of mind she would have noticed that the voice sounded like Naruto's voice, but sadly she wasn't so she did what the voice said and gave into her anger. The chains that held Conan shattered like glass when she gave into her anger, and the entire ship shook, causing both of Nikesti's HK droids and all the dark GD aboard to swarm to the location to protect their emperor. Conan felt better than great she felt as if she could take on Madara Chia head on and emerge victorious. She heard something land on the ground in front of her which she picked up and examined it. The object had a straight hilt approximately 20 to 30 centimeters long and had no defining features aside from the exposed red crystal in the center a standard hilt minus the exposed crystal. 
The press the red nub to activate the blade and enact your revenge, the voice whispered again guiding her. Conan ignited the lightsaber and charged at McKesty, who ignited one of his curved hilt lightsabers and put the arm that wasn't holding his lightsaber behind his back while using the other to block Conan's strikes. Your hatred is strong, but it could be stronger. McKesty said as he caught the tip of Conan's lightsaber causing the blade to shut off due to the kurtosis that was used to make his gantlet shocking Conan. McKesty lets forth violent blue arcs of force lightning blasting Conan into a set of cages. At that moment Dark GD swarmed into the lab lightsabers ignited and ready to eliminate any and all threats to their Dark Lord of H.A.T.R.E.D. McKesty. McKesty seemed to not even notice the Dark GD, or he didn't acknowledge their presence, and kept up his unrelenting arcs of force lightning on Conan, who was screaming and begging for him to stop, which only made him increase the voltage causing smoke to rise from her skin and her screams to become louder. Scream worm. Scream. McKesty yelled feeding off of her pain. McKesty would have continued if he hadn't felt Karen's hand in his shoulder. The Dark Lord stopped his force lightning allowing the unconscious woman to fall to the ground. HK-47 and 51 take her to the med bay on Karen's flagship. Karen go with them when she wakes reprogram her mind. McKesty commanded and shot Karen a look that said take this serious and got a nod from the redhead. You heard him droids get her to the med bay. Karen yelled making the two hunter killer droids grab Conan's arms and drag her out of Karen's old lab with Karen close behind. Ah you 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 also return to your flagship we'll be leaving for the Tafel system. Nikesti said before phasing out of existence. Bridge. Nikesti phased back into existence on the Pride's bridge in a sitting position on his throne and sent Fleared his force presence to summon Skylray. Skylray instantly dropped what she was doing and approached Nikesti's throne, you called my liege. The Grand Admiral asked. Skylray relayed the coordinates for the jump to Tafel Vi, then give the orders to jump to hyperspace in two hours. Also I will be in my chambers conversing with my masters, so don't disturb me or I will kill whoever does Nikesti warned, his eyes glowing an eerie yellow creeping Skylray the fuck out. A as you wish my lord she mentally berated herself for stuttering in front of Nikesti. The redhead stood up and hurried off to carry out her orders and escape the glowing yellow eyes staring at her retreating form. Nikesti once again phased out of existence. If some of you are wondering about how he does it, he breaks his body down into the force and travels to his destination. The Kesti's chambers. The Kesti phased into existence in his chambers in a meditative position on his bed and sent his mind to the shared mindscape that he and his masters shared. Shared mindscape. The shared mindscape of Nikesti and his masters was an infinite black and red void, with several thrones arranged into a circle floating in the void. Beside each throne were two large banners displaying the insignia of their respective Sith empires, and two large serpent-like BEASTS the name will be reviled at a later date that acted as their eyes and ears for the outside world that swayed left to right eyes alert for anything that might catch their master's interest. At the moment only Revan was in the shared mindscape, while Nikesti other masters were off doing whatever they normally did with their time. Revan have you investigated the anomaly in the Maw Cluster? Nikesti asked getting straight to business. Revan let out a heavy sigh, he knew he would have to tell his apprentice about Abelf one day. I've known what the anomaly in the Maw Cluster was for as long as I've known Hidzuska, but I can't tell you who she is, you'll have to ask Hidzuska, because it's not my place to tell you about her. The Kesti deadpanned at his master, and you couldn't have told me about her when I told you about it. No since like I said it's not my place to tell about her like I said. If you want to know about her then call Hidzuska into the mindscape and ask him. Revan replied. The Kesti nodded and locked onto Hidzuska location and pulled his mind into the mindscape. Hidzuska appeared in all his intimidating glory with a pissed off expression on his face, why have you called me here Naruto? I wish to know about an anomaly in the Maw Cluster that was calling me toward two black holes, saying Hat Mother is calling her children home, and Revan said it wasn't his place to tell me about her Nikesti carefully said seeing the mood that the strongest and the only one of his masters that was still living. Hidzuska's looked between Revan and Naruto and said her name's Abelith, she's as old as the galaxy itself, she's my wife, she's a dark side entity like myself, she's imprisoned in the Maw Cluster and stay away from her until the I tell you that the time is right for us to free her from her prison, Hidzuska said before leaving the mindscape so that Nikesti couldn't ask him any more questions. Nikesti mind was processing the information that he just received and could only say one thing Hidzuska has a wife. Revan only nodded I found it just as hard to believe as you did when he told me, but don't think about it too much kiddo he'll tell you the story of how they met one day and don't bug him about it, it brings up bad memories for him. Before Nikesti could say anything Revan interrupted him your fleet just left hyperspace and are about to enter the space battle. Nikesti nodded and disappeared from the mindscape, leaving Revan alone in to do whatever it is that he does in his free time. Nikesti's Chambers. 
the Kesti opened his eyes and was nearly knocked off of his bed when his ship shook violently, mostly from being hit by a proton torpedo. Nikesti jumped off his bed and ran out of his chambers toward the bridge. Bridge. The Kesti barged onto the Pride's bridge and made a beeline toward Skylray to get brought up to speed on what he missed. Skylray why the hell did you engage the enemy fleet as soon as we left hyperspace? Nikesti asked. Skylray bowed before standing at attention as soon as we left hyperspace the enemy fleet opened fire on us and we responded in kind. Skylray reported. Identify the enemy's command ship and hail them Nikesti commanded. We already have my lord. Hailing them now. The red-haired Grand Admiral replied while hailing the enemy's command ship. The Kesti walked over to one of the holo terminals and awaited for the enemy's admiral's holographic figure to appear. The Kesti barged onto the Pride's bridge and made a beeline toward Skylray to get brought up to speed on what he missed. Skylray why the hell did you engage the enemy fleet as soon as we left hyperspace? The Kesti asked. Skylray bowed before standing at attention as soon as we left hyperspace the enemy fleet opened fire on us and we responded in kind. Skylray reported. Identify the enemy's command ship and hail them Nikesti commanded. We already have my lord. Hailing them now. The red-haired Grand Admiral replied while hailing the enemy's command ship. Nikesti walked over to one of the holo terminals and awaited for the enemy's admiral's holographic figure to appear. Bull caught up let's god. Nikesti impatiently waited for the enemy commander to answer his hail if this scum doesn't answer he'll be the first one to die Nikesti thought his anger rising by the second. He waited for another 12 minutes, but no one answered, and now Nikesti was completely and utterly pissed off, and a pissed off Nikesti equaled a very high mortality rate to the one who pissed him off and anyone who followed him. Nikesti called over Skylrig yes my lord she asked not really wanting to be around Nikesti when he was in a pissed off mood. My crew jump us beside the enemy's command ship and launch the boarding parties Nikesti ground out through clenched teeth. Yes my lord Skylray scurried away happy to not be near Nikesti at the moment. One micro jump later. As soon as the Pride of the Sith dropped out of hyperspace beside the enemy's command ship hundreds of escape pods shot out of the Pride burrowing their way into what scans reported was the ship named the Redeemer. The fleet Nikesti is fighting are some of the followers of Malak that defected when Malak was killed by Revan and established an empire in the unknown regions. The ship is an interdictor class cruiser and hundreds of Imperial assault craft shot out of the Pride's hangars into the Redeemer hangars dropping off their passengers. One of the imp assault crafts was carrying the Kesti in them, he left Skylray to watch over the space battle, while he goes on a murdering spree. Redeemer unknown level. On every level fighting was going on, and the followers of Malak were losing badly, the reborn Sith troopers was vastly superior to that of the outdated Sith trooped armor that was passed down from father to son in the followers of Malak. The reborn Sith trooper's armor protected the wearer from everything but a well-placed headshot, hell even thermal detonators had little effect on them, the armor was made to dampen the force of an explosion to levels where the wearer would only be knocked out or just suffer from a few broken bones. In the Sith trooper training program they are put through hell to increase their pain tolerance so that broken bones or blaster wounds wouldn't majorly hamper their combat prowess when in combat situations. Their training also completely desensitized them to the death that always came with war. Push forward men. One of the reborn Sith troopers yelled as he mowed down enemy after enemy with his standard issue LS-150 heavy accelerated charge particle repeater gun, either killing or injuring them, as he and the 10 squads of troopers, a reborn Sith squad have 20 troopers, each pushed the opposing troops back toward the HANGER the one Akesti's in. One of the followers of Malak threw a thermal detonator, only for it to be caught by the trooper with the repeating blaster and thrown back to the sender, where it exploded in his face, killing him and 10 other unfortunate men who were caught in the blast. The reborn Sith troopers heard screams behind the followers of Malak's lines and saw bodies go flying. Hold your fire men you might hit the Emperor. The trooper yelled stopping all the other troopers from firing. But Nikesti. Nikesti didn't even ignite his lightsaber, he instead used his bare hands and the force to slaughter each and every follower. Nikesti caught a vibroblade slash that would have severed his arm and shattered the blade in force, pushing the broken blade shards into the blade's owner, then using his body to block incoming blaster fire before force, pushing the body into the followers of Malak that shot at him knocking them down. He activated his wrist-mounted flamethrower and cooked the troops he knocked down alive, before using the force to change the direction of the flames so that they hit the trooper that tried to blindside is also cooking him in his armor. Nikesti had to jump over a slash aimed for his legs and delivering a dropkick to the wielder of the blade, shattering his ribcage and rupturing his lungs and heart. Pathetic I'm not even breaking a sweat with these fools he inwardly thought while scuffing of the outside. Die you bastard. One of the dumber follower of Malak tell while charging at Nikesti who grabbed the man's face, lifted him of the ground and slamming him into the floor with enough force that the man's brain was turned to goo. 
the Kesti decided to charge into the remaining followers of Malak, sending a large number of them flying, before he came to an abrupt halt and backhanded an unlucky trooper snapping his neck and causing his head to twist backwards. There was only about five follower of Malak left if Nikesti counted right. Nikesti in a burst of pure speed impaled two troopers through their chest with his hands, and Sparta kicked a third one through a wall. Electricity exploded from his hands striking the remaining two followers of Malak vaporizing their bodies, they didn't even get a chance to scream. But the unnamed reborn Sith trooper. He watched in awe as his emperor slaughtered the followers of Malak one by one, without even being hit once. When Nikesti killed the last two followers of Malak the trooper was the first one to start cheering, the troops behind him soon followed. When Nikesti approached the two trooper platoons, five squads equals one platoon, the stood at attention saluting their emperor. Nikesti ignored the rest of the troops and walked in front of the trooper with the repeating blaster trooper, what is your name and rank? He asked. Arano Wester, hi Colonel Sir the now named Arano, replied while looking his emperor in the eyes. Arano was a large man by all means he stood at a staggering 7-4 and was built like a fucking brick H-O-U-S-E he has to be to even use his repeating blaster, his face that of a hardened warrior. His eyes were a pure black and constantly surveying the area for any threats to his emperor. His hair was also black and cut into a buzz cut. He wore a modified version of the standard imperial trooper's armor that was made to fit his large structure. Are you sure that's your rank General Nikesti said. He had saw how Rano led his men during the attack on Kanoha, but didn't promote him, but through the use of foresight, he watched the man mow down enemy after enemy with his repeating blaster, and him catching the thermal detonator vastly impressed him. The Kesti activated one of the seals on his armor, and out came a code cylinder, rank identifier, with a total of eight tabs, four red tabs on the top and four blue tabs on the bottom, and attached it to Rano's armor. It is an honor Emperor Rano said while bowing. You and you platoons are to accompany me to this ship's bridge. Nikesti commanded. Sir yes sir. You heard the emperor men fall in behind him. The newly promoted general yell causing the two platoons of men to fall into line behind Nikesti, who had already started walking and Arano who was a few steps behind Nikesti. Redeemer outside the blast door leading to the bridge. The remaining followers of Malak were held up on the bridge and barricaded the blast door to buy themselves time to regroup, not that Nikesti was going to give them any time to regroup. The Kesti unsealed twelve lightsabers from one of the seals on his hand and grasped each of them with a force igniting the red blades. He sent the sabers at the blast door and willed them to start cutting a large circular hole. Once the hole was cut the lightsabers returned to Nikesti who resealed them and with a flick of his wrist, the entire blast door minus the party cut was ripped from the wall and was sent toward the remaining followers of Malak. More than half were crushed, while the other half were mowed down by blaster fire, leaving only the Admiral, Nikesti and the reborn Sith troopers on the bridge. The unnamed admiral was shaking in fear, he didn't expect for the reborn emperor himself to assault his flagship. The man sighed I guess this is it, what a ride it's been he thought, while his long 73 years of living flashed before his eyes. He saw his long dead parents, his now dead older brother, being forced to join the navy and rising through the ranks, and his smiling great-grandchildren, as he walked up his ship's boarding ramp. The thought of his grandchildren caused tears to threaten Taliak from his eyes little Abari, Trirao I guess grandpa won't be coming home this time he thought, and the dam burst and tears flowed down his face. The elderly man turned his back to Nikesti and looked out the viewport observing the last ship in his fleet, aside from his ship explode. He turned back to face Nikesti who still hadn't moved and gave a grandfatherly smile, reminding Nikesti of his grandfather figure here as in Suratobi Emperor, allow an old man one last wish the man began while fishing through the pockets of his admiral's uniform and pulled out a data pad and a data spike, please deliver these to my grandchildren when you inevitably invade the planet below and allow. This old fool to go down with his ship the old man pleaded causing Nikesti to double take, he could have sworn he old man third in the place of the old admiral. The Kesti was conflicted on what he should do, the Sith and Rakuten parts of him were telling him to kill the old man, while the Uzumaki, Naruto and that small voice in the back of his head were telling him to let the old man live. Ah I'm so confused he reminds me so much of old man third. Do what feels best to you my boy a voice that sounded like Hiruzen said in the Kesti's head. Gigi? The blonde dark lord asked but got no response. Do what feels best. What could he mean by that? The Kesti thought. The loud slapping sound echoed through his mindscape. Breaking of the fourth wall alert. Time stopped on the bridge and everything turned gray. The Kesti looked around looking for the author KNG are you there? He asked looking around trying to find the author. You're an idiot Naruto why can be as smart as your pirate counterpart? KNG said while stepping out of a dark spot on the wall. KNG was covered from head to toe in black and wore a black oni mask. 
I mean really Hirazin's word were easy to decipher. He meant to follow what your heart says, not what the dark side says, not what a voice in the back of your head says, what your heart says he said, before dispersing into hundreds of blades, causing time to resume, and the bridge to regain its color. Breaking of the fourth wall end. Before someone says that Nikesti isn't acting like a Sith by sparing the old man not all Sith are the same, and Nikesti has little to no info on the planet's defenses he's going to invade, so he can get the info out of the Admiral. A libel excuse to spare the old guy right? Right. Deliver it yourself. Once you've told us everything you know about the planetary defenses that is Nikesti said while fringing indifference and walking walking off the bridge, leaving Arano and his Sith troopers to detain the elderly Admiral. If Nikesti looked over his shoulder, he would have seen the force ghost of Hirazin smiling at him, you've grown into a fine young man Naruto, still oblivious toward the feelings of your older cousins. But a fine young man nonetheless is the old Kage thought letting out a perverted giggle that went unnoticed by Nikesti at the thought of what Nikesti would do when he figured out the two redheads' feelings toward him. Cipher Alpha Karen's lab. Karen's new lab was the exact same as the one on the Pride. The lab would normally be filled with Karen's experiments, but for the task that Nikesti had given her, she had the HKs move the experiments to another lab, while she mind fuck. Played Conan. The blue-haired paper user was once again chained up, but instead of being chained to wall she was chained to a metal chair. The chains were covered in Sith runes that glowed a dim red showing that they were active. Nai Chan did say to reprogram her, but he didn't say what to program her to. What to do what to do. The likely insane redhead hummed and thought. A devious smirk that spelled bad intentions played its way onto the mad doctor's face I never did get Nai Chan back for that prank he played on me. With what Karen had in mind both Nikesti and Conan were going to wish the paper user was dead. And her insane giggle, we're going to be the bestest of friends once you're programmed to be Nai Chan's loyal but not useless fan girl giggle dot, we'll share everything even Nai Chan's bed insane perverted giggle dot. Well first we'll have to get him to notice our feeling first, then we can fuck like rabbits the now, who did know, confirmed insanely perverted redhead said out loud. But Nikesti. The Kesti who was on a shuttle back to the Pride shuddered and found the odd need to quadruple the amount of guards around his room while he sleeps, but dismissed it as his nerves getting bad. Back with Karen. Perrin put her hand on Conan's head and forced her way into the paper user's mind. Inside Conan's mind. Perrin appeared in Conan's and Tokidor surroundings, as Karen had expected Conan's mind was filled with origami, ranging from origami birds to origami dragons. No no no, this just won't do for my bestest friend, maybe I should dim her love for origami and replace all the origami with paintings of Nai-chan, and just as she said the origami was replaced with paintings of Nikesti. Karen tapped her chin and thought now that that's covered I wonder where her memories are. The insane redhead started to aimlessly walk through Conan's mindscape in hopes of finding the place where memories were stored. One hour late ter imagine the guy from Spongebob. Perrin had finally found the blue-haired woman's memories cortex and began her work of mind fuck. Reprogramming Conan. Nai-chan probably wants all memories of Nagato team removed of to give Conan a deep-sated hate for team and a major fuck you to Nagato. Perrin watched Conan's memories as they played through from the day she was born to when Nikesti knocked her out, changing any major memory that included Nagato to make the self-proclaimed god into the bad guy and making it where Nikesti would come to her rescue. She changed her memory of Yuhiko's death to make it look like Nagato stabbed Yuhiko, instead of the orange-haired teen impaling himself. She even added in some false memories such as her and Karen being childhood friends, a few memories to cement her newfound love of Nikesti, the basics of light whip combat, light dagger combat, and the four stealth technique. Once the insane redhead was finished mind fuck. Reprogramming her gift prank for her Nai-chan, she walked out of Conan's memory cortex and exited the blue-haired woman's mind. Perrin's lab. Perrin opened her eyes for the first time after being in Conan's mind for two and a half hours. She knew that her new best friend wouldn't wake up for about 30 minutes, which was more than enough time for her to get them both aboard Nikesti's flagship. But Nikesti, Pride of the Sith, Cantina. The Pride's Cantina was the most crowded place on the Pride after a successful battle. Nikesti and Arano were currently having a drinking contest which attracted a large crowd of people who were cheering for both their emperor and their newest general. Large mugs and beer bottles were quickly piling up around the two men. Nikesti and Arano were currently on their 20th bottle and both looked like they weren't going to stop anytime soon well they would have kept going if Karen hadn't decided to interrupt them by attaching herself to her Nai-chan knocking the air out of him, causing him to spit out a mouth full of beer into Arano's face. Nikesti was about to electrocute his cousin when he another pair of arms wrapped them themselves around his chest. The owner of the arms whispered something into Nikesti's ear that caused the blonde emperor to go pale once her realized who had their arms around him and that her didn't give Karen any specific instructions on how to reprogram Conan. 
Seeing as he had no ideal how to react to the situation that he was in, so he resorted to what he normally does when Karen does this. Nikesti discharged 200,000 volts of electricity from his body and electrocuting the now two headache-inducing red and blue-haired subordinates. He quickly got out of his seat and punted both headaches across the cantina where they smashed through the wall and conveniently landed in the medbay that was next to the cantina. Pride of the Sith, three days later. Three days had passed since Nikesti sent both headache-inducing women to the medbay. Over the course of the three days Nikesti had gotten received the information about the planetary defenses, troop numbers, turbo laser amplicements, enemy tactics, and the location of the current followers of Malak's leader's palace. But that information in hand, Nikesti ordered his Ta Yuya and Karen's forces to deploy to the planet's surface just about 12 hours ago. From what reports were saying the attack on the capital city was not going well, his forces were having trouble penetrating the capital city's wall and had lost more than a third of the men under the command of one of his incompetent GENERALS Nadarano, due to heavy artillery fire and multiple attempts to scale the wall. It didn't help that the city was surrounded by a shield that protected it from orbital bombardment. Seeing as the incompetent general need to be replaced Anarano was the closest to the capital city and he had just successfully completed his mission to capture an industrial city with minimal losses. Due to need to replace a general Nikesti decided to join the battle for the capital himself and see to its conquest personally. Nikesti was currently inside of his private hangar walking up the boarding ramp of Tsadatazi Wana. Three days had passed since Nikesti sent both headache-inducing women to the medbay. Over the course of the three days Nikesti had gotten received the information about the planetary defenses, troop numbers, turbo laser emplacements, enemy tactics, and the location of the current followers of Malak's leader's palace. But that information in hand, Nikesti ordered his Ta Yuya and Karen's forces to deploy to the planet's surface just about 12 hours ago. From what reports were saying the attack on the capital city was not going well, his forces were having trouble penetrating the capital city's wall and had lost more than a third of the men under the command of one of his incompetent generals, Nadarano, due to heavy artillery fire and multiple attempts to scale the wall. It didn't help that the city was surrounded by a shield that protected it from orbital bombardment. Seeing as the incompetent general need to be replaced Anarano was the closest to the capital city and he had just successfully completed his mission to capture an industrial city with minimal losses. Due to need to replace a general Nikesti decided to join the battle for the capital himself and see to its conquest personally. Nikesti was currently inside of his private hangar walking up the boarding ramp of Tsadatazi Wana. All caught up let's go. Half old I, just outside of the capital city. Nikesti walked down Tsadatazi Wana boarding ramp toward the awaiting and soon to be dead general who seemed to be oblivious to just what kind of danger he was in. When Nikesti reached the end of Tsadatazi Wana boarding ramp, the general saluted his emperor. Only when Nikesti was standing in front of the general did he feel just what kind of danger he was in. MML Lord Why You Your La La Act the general grasped at his throat, is a futile attempt to remove Nikesti's hand from his neck. Corpus for you incompetence I sentence you and your family to death, Nikesti said before snapping the now dead general's neck with a flick of his wrist and dropped the dead body to the ground. Nikesti pulled out his comlink and Skyle Ray's holographic form appeared my lord. The red had asked. Land the pride at my location and activate the HK droids and have the racket and annihilators and walkers prepped and ready for battle Nikesti commanded. As you wish my lord the red-haired admiral bow before ending the transmission. With reinforcements on the way Nikesti set out to examine the damage the soldiers had sustained under the now dead general. Three hours later. Three hours had eclipsed since Nikesti ordered the pride to land. The pride had indeed landed and currently had its boarding ramp extended. Walking down its ramp were racket and annihilators large metal contraptions that were shaped like the Star Forge. It walked on two legs and had a central sphere that featured two small lasers that were complemented by a large destructive beam that could be generated from its underside. A thin red viewport spanned the sphere. A new feature that Nikesti added to the annihilators was the ability to fly, they could switch from land mode to flight mode in just a few seconds. While in flight mode the two lasers on its front were disabled and their power was added to the laser beam on their underbelly. Racket and walkers were larger versions of the annihilators, but the main difference was the four massive legs that adorned its sides. The walkers had a thin red viewport on each side and six lasers under each viewport, but no laser on its underbelly. On the top of their four legs were launch tubes that fired long-range heavy proton torpedoes. When the walkers and annihilators were finished unloading from the pride 400 racket and annihilators and 300 racket and walkers stood in rows of five. 
but the Walkers and Annihilators unloaded the 99th HK Black Ops Legion who were led by HK-47, just over 400 Sith Lords and Darths, Nikesti's personal army the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th Imperial Royal Assault System Armies, a system army is normally composed of 1 to 3 armies, and has a total of 2. 5 million troopers in them, which form the Royal Sector ARMY Sector Army, is composed of 2 to 4 systems armies, and has a total of 10 million troopers, and 5 cloaked figures marched out of the pride. The systems army's armor was completely red with the reborn insignia covering the front of their helmets. The first and tallest of the seven stood at 6'3 and was built like a brick house. His face was hidden behind his crimson red helmet and hood, his attire consisted of crimson red armor and a tattered black cape bearing the reborn insignia, signifying that he was a field marshal. On his back was a CZX-4 assault cannon, it's a double-barreled mini-gun pick on deviant art profile, along with an accelerated charge particle repeater gun. The second figure was a female that stood at 5'9", she sported a skinny but athletic build. Her heart-shaped face was framed by two black bangs that stopped at her chin, the rest of her hair was tied into ponytail that went down to her shoulders. She wore crimson red armor that left her stomach exposed and a black cape bearing the reborn insignia, signifying that she too was a field marshal. On her back was an E-11 sniper rifle and a Mandalorian heavy blaster on her hip. The third figure was the shortest of the seven, he stood a laughable 5'4". Half of his face was covered by a red surgical mask, only allowing his somehow black glowing eyes to be seen. Unlike the rest of the figures he wore no armor and instead wore a crimson red lab coat over a black dress shirt with a reborn insignia on the right breast pocket, red dress pants and black combat boots. His attire showed that he was a field marshal while also showing that he was a medic. On his back was a backpack that was filled with medical equipment to keep the people he deemed meat bags, he was trained by both HKs, it it makes sense that the medic would pick up HK-47's quirk, but what else did he pick up from the sadistic droids? Alive or kill them slowly and painfully if he ever felt like it. He had two Mandalorian heavy blasters on his hips and Verbro knife strapped to his chest. The fourth and fifth figures were the second tallest of the seven, both stood at 6'1". They unlike the rest of the seven figures they were twin Twi'leks, the weirdest thing about the twins was their skin color. Both had pitch black skin with red tattoos covering their bodies. Think Darth Talon skin color and tattoos, but the colors are inverted. They both wore modified versions of Karnas Muir's robes, picture on my deviant art profile, the robes were dyed dark red and black. On their hips was a double-bladed lightsaber that had an exposed core putting their red-centric black outlined lightsaber crystals on display. These two weren't even Mandalorians, they were Nikesti apprentices. The twins caught the blonde emperor's eye on one of his trips to Korriban when they killed their fellow acolytes and a few overseers in a fit of rage. HK-47 was the first one to speak greetings. Salutations master. Query. Will I be seeing and causing any bloodshed today master? The Kesti chuckled at his bloodthirsty protocol hunter killer droids love for killing people. Yes HK we will get to kill as many meat bags as you want. Joyous statement. Wonderful master, activating assassination protocols level 5 for maximum disintegration of all hostile meat bags, the murderous HK droid said with glee, getting a sweat drop from the Kesti. Deciding that any further dialogue with HK-47 would cause him to burst out into a fit of laughter, the blonde Dark Lord of the Sith turned to his two apprentices Karen and Shsei, this shall be your first test, the capital city of this planet is surrounded by a shield, your task to sneak behind enemy lines and destroy the shield generator without being detected. As you wish master the twin said before using force stealth to turn invisible and bolted off toward the wall that prevented their master's armies from subjugating the capital city of Tathol Vi. The Kesti then turned to HK-47 and the three field marshals you four will providing fighter support. As you command Master Emperor Nikesti's ever so loyal droid subjects eluded and went off to polish their weapons. The armor-clad blonde went off to get some Raymond from a certain father-daughter duo. Raymond Raymond Raymond. Raymond is essential for a growing Dark Lord of the Sith to be eviler every passing day. Revan and Hadzuska who decided to be lazy and see what kind of trouble Nikesti would get into both had a deadpan expression on their faces at their apprentice's thoughts. They may have beat his love of orange and bright orange jumpsuit that screamed hey look here I am come shoot me, but they couldn't beat the unhealthy obsession with Raymond out of him, no matter how many times they tried brainwashing, training with vibroblades, grueling training sessions, making him run 90 laps around the land of waves, or simply depriving him of it. Two hours later, Two hours had eclipsed since Nikesti sent his apprentices to destroy the shield generator, and they had yet to return. Nikesti didn't notice though because he was trying to break his record of 123 bowls of Raymond when the pride of the Sith shake violently, causing his 122 bowl of Raymond to fall to the ground when the bowl broke. Nikesti's face went from despair to pain, then anger in a quick succession. 
before he could express his anger, a unlucky trooper ran into the mess hall. Large explosions have gone off in the center of the followers of Malek's capital Syak. The trooper couldn't finish his sentence because Nikesti grabbed him by his throat and ripped his head off causing blood to spray out of the now headless body covering Nikesti and the mess hall's walls. The blonde emperor dropped the head and kicked the corpus out of the mess hall and set a course to the staging point. Staging point. Nikesti walked down the pride's boarding ramp and had to cover his eyes when the unforgiving sun assaulted his eyes, damn that's bright he thought while putting on his helmet. Looking around Nikesti spotted his two apprentices walking into what he assumed to be the general's tent covered in sod. Deciding to follow behind them Nikesti also entered the tent. Inside the tent was a large crowd of soldiers surrounding a hollow table that projected a map of the enemy capital, in the center of the crowd he spotted a mop of red hair. Nikesti quickly ruled out Karen since she was a horrible tactician and disliked being on the front lines unless she had no other choice. Nikesti not wanting to interrupt his cousin he suppressed his force presence and decided to listen in and correct her if need be. Walker operators your main task is to hit strong points in the opposing armies and make breaches in the wall so that our troops may enter the city without having to scale the wall. Annihilator operators you will be tasked with providing aerial support for phase 1 of the assault assisting the walkers in creating breaches in sectors 1 to 4. Once phase 2 begins you are to land and assist our ground forces in sectors 2 and 4. Once phase 2 ends and phase 3 starts converge on the palace from sectors 3 and 5. You will be assisting the troops in giving cover fire for your emperor as he entered the palace before returning to what you were doing in phase 2. Ah you you would have continued if she didn't feel a hand touch her shoulder, the red head swung around and tried to punch the owner of the hand, but the owner easily caught her hand I'll take over from here, ta you you the blonde said ignoring the glare ta you you sent his way. The Kesti pressed a button on the table and a red line made its way from sector 3, 5, making many twists and turns until it stopped at a building that was labeled bunker, once the wall has been breached, you lot will be entering from sectors 2, 3, and 5. Once you've entered the city you'll split up and spread out to sectors 3 and 4. Once this has been achieved phase 2 will commence, during phase 2 the units in sector 3 will push toward to civvy bunkers and capture and hold that position for the duration of the assault. The bunkers are spread out all over the city but are connected via underground tunnels, this is where you all will capture the 12 other bunkers. When you enter the tunnels via the civvy bunker in sector you will split once again into 13 groups, one group will guard the bunker in sector 3 and make sure the civvies in the bunker don't rebel, while the other 12 groups will take the other 12 bunkers. The Kesti once again the Kesti pressed a button on the hollow table and a red line traveled from sector 1 and 4 traveled in a straight line before splitting into two separate lines. The line from sector 1 traveled directly to the palace while the line from sector 4 looped around the palace before stopping at the back of the palace and two lines moved from either side of the sector 1 and 4 and met halfway encircling the palace in a red circle. From each side of the large circle many star forages surrounded the palace. System armies 1 and 4 once the walls have been breached you will enter the city and make a beeline for the palace. Once you've made it halfway to the palace system army 4, you are to split off from the system army 1 and make your way to the back of the palace. When I've gotten confirmation from sector army 4 that they are in place I will give the orders to surround the palace. At this point the annihilators should be at the palace where they will assist in ensuring that no one escapes from the palace. While you are all ensuring that no one escapes the palace I will enter the palace via an underground tunnel I will create through classified means from there I will fight my way to the throne room and boom the followers of Malak's king is dead. All that will be left to do after that is kill the remaining soldiers and establish control of the capital. Dismissed. Why are you all still standing here your emperor has issued your orders you have three hours to prep your gear so get fucking to it maggots. Ta you yelled causing the gathered troopers and the troopers all over the base to scramble to get ready, their helmets are capable of displaying holo feeds, lest they incur the wrath of the emperor's wraith, pun intended. So which army am I leading shithead the foul-mouthed redhead asked. None. None. What the hell do you mean none, I refuse to sit here and do nothing while there's shit tons of killing to do. And that's why you'll be at my side for since you're better suited for frontline combat and my armies just so happen to have the heaviest resistance. So you want to do that technique? No we will be testing out a new model of Necron I made a while back. Where's it at? Follow me. The Kesti walked out of the tent toward the pride with Ta Yu hot on his heels. Pride of the Sith secret level. The Kesti and Ta Yu walked out of the turbo lift to a level that even she didn't know about. Naruto what level is this? The normally vulgar redhead asked using his real name for the first time in a long while. This is the Necron level Ta Yuya, where I create all of the Necron units. I'm the only one that has access to it currently, since the NEM only willingly listens to me, Nikesti answered while punching in a coat into a panel on the wall. A sharp hiss was heard as the massive door opened allowing Ta Yuya to see inside of the equally massive room. 
One section of the room contained tens of thousands Necron units. Another was filled with Necrofeed ships as big as the Pride, walkers, weapons, and speeders. Weight as big as the Pride, that couldn't be right they were inside of the Pride. The Kesti sensing her confusion said I used Sith runes to make this room a separate dimension, and expansion seals to expand the room to 90 times the size of the Starforge's deck 67. Ah you you not knowing what to say just nodded her head still not able to grasp what she's seen. The Kesti walked over to a large serpent-like creature. The creature was 39 meters, 127 feet long and 50 meters, 164 feet tall. Its body was pitch black, while its underbelly was green in the spaces between the scales, its head was cone-shaped when closed, but when it's open, it's a truly terrifying sight to see. When open the head is surrounded by sharp rotating blades that allowed it to burrow underground, and a glowing green mouth that held seven rotating curved teeth. Its back was covered by menacing sharp spines that dripped a green liquid that sizzled when it hit the ground. On its tail was a large stinger that could lay eggs that would spawn miniature versions of itself that make their way to the surface and explode. It can also spew out necrotomous to necrophy and enemy or swallow large groups of enemies to necrophy them inside its body, which would normally take two days to necrophy a living being, but in its belly two weeks in there is ten minutes on the outside. It can't produce necrotomous naturally, so it can run out of necrotomous unless the NEM is inside its belly. This Tayuya is my greatest creations to date this is the Crypt Tunneler, it's the worm coil engine from Magic and Gathering. It digs, undermines, lays eggs that spawn exploding miniature versions of itself, sometimes attacks and when it attacks. Let's just leave it at the fact that when it does attack there's not much left of its victims, can spew out necrotomous to necrophy its victims, create a necrophied tunnel that necron units could warp into, and swallow enemies whole to be necrophied in just 10 minutes. Nikesti explained causing Ta Yuya to faint with drool leaking out of her mouth. I guess her brain couldn't process what it just heard. Oh well we've got a schedule to keep, and waiting for her to wake up could take a while. Nikesti said aloud and picked Tayuya up and placed her on his shoulders and walked over to the crypt tunneler, who lowered its open head to the group so that its katan could enter it. Outside of the pride, 10 meters, 32 feet below staging area, 3 hours later, inside of the crypt tunneler, command room. The crypt tunneler warped into a tunnel that Nikesti had a few necrons dig an hour ago. The command room of the crypt tunneler was just a formality, the crypt tunneler was sentient. The command room wasn't very spacious it was only big enough to comfortably house three people, it had three thrones placed side by side. Nikesti was currently sitting in the middle throne, and Tayuya was sitting in the one to his right. Nikesti was preparing to give the signal to commence the attack. Nikesti's Charnos, clock, countdown hit zero, Nikesti's voice could be heard by everyone in the staging point Kakasasutsi Tita Wo Iwariya Simi. Commence phase one of the ATTACK. Staging point, racket and walkers. The Kasasutsi Tita Wo Iwariya Simi. The 300 racket and walkers who were now separated into five groups of 60, all fired off their long-range heavy proton torpedoes. Tathol Prime, City Defense Wall. The City Defense Wall was known by the citizens of Tathol Prime, has the impenetrable wall due to never once being penetrated in its duty protecting the city from ground assaults for the past two millennium, guess they never heard of the saying there's a first time for everything. The troopers stationed on the wall were lazing off when the proximity alarms went off causing the ones in the control room that were sleeping on the job to jolt awake to the sight of the sky being blackened by proton torpedoes. They began to try and bring the flak cannons online, but something locked them out of the controls, all they could do is watch as the torpedoes rained down death and destruction. A well-placed torpedo ripped through seven levels before detonating in munitions storage room, casing an even larger explosion which caused that section to collapse on itself, burying the unfortunate troopers alive. Just when the still-living troopers thought it couldn't get any worse the sky was once again blackened, but this time it wasn't from torpedoes, but by squadrons, five per squadron, oddly shaped ships. The ships rained down concentrated beams of superheated plasma onto the wall, melting parts of it and incinerating anyone unlucky enough to be standing on or in that part of the wall. But Nikesti. Nikesti was watching the carnage on a hollow screen with an evil grin that was mirrored by Ta Yuyuka Kasasutsi Titiyun commence phase 2. Staging point. In the space adjacent to the racket and walkers were hundreds of thousands of imperial shuttles that were taking off heading toward the wall to deliver the troops they were carrying. Forty minutes later, Crypt Tunneler. The Crypt Tunneler was stationary laying eggs under the city's power reactor. The eggs were three nine feet meters in height, they were white in color covered in green pulsing veins. As the final egg was laid making a total of 15 eggs they all started to hatch 4 meter, 13 feet, mini Crypt Tunnelers emerged out of the eggs and slithered along the walls and began to burrow toward the surface, which just so happened to be over the power generator's main reactors. After a four-minute wait explosions could be heard and felt underground. On the surface. 
the followers of Malak that were stationed around the power generator were knocked off their feet when the generator they were defending suddenly and violently exploded. Before they could all get back up a monstrous metal beast burst from the ground and swallowed the followers of Malak, burped and went back underground. Inside of the crypt tunneler, command room. The Kesti and Tayu you were listening to reports from the surface marshals. Sir the bunker in sector 3 is under our control, and as we speak, I am overseeing the group assigned to watching the civilians, the surface marshal of sector armies 2, 3 and 5 reported. How many casualties have you sustained? Tayuya asked. We lost 400,000 while trying to transverse through a minefield in sector 3, and another 20,000 fighting for the civilian bunker. The command room became deathly silent, and the surface marshal became fearful for his life. He flinched when Tayu your right hand made a clenching motion and fell dead from a blaster bolt to the back of the head, courtesy of Arano. Excellent work take over command of sector armies under the cadavers command Nikesti said, while laying the other surface marshal who was sweating profusely. Got it boss. Arano said before cutting off the holo terminal. Is there something you wish to say meet Nikesti's cold voice caused the color to drain from the surface marshal's face and cold sweat to form on his brow. WW we lost al 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 almost tw twice that m my lord. Please don't kill me the surface marshal begged. I'm not going to kill you. You're going to kill yourself marshal or I'll personally see to it that your entire bloodline is sold into slavery well. Nikesti didn't get to finish because the surface marshal shot himself in the head with his holdout blaster. S. I should have told him that I was going to do it even if he did commit suicide. Oh well Nikesti said with a shrug. Hey you there Nikesti said to one of the officers that was moving the surface marshal's body out of the way. Me my lord. Yes you congratulations on your promotion if you fail me like the corpse did your family will have to worry about more than slavery am I clear Nikesti said, starting off nice then ending with his voice as cold as Ilum. Understood my liege Nikesti nodded and shut off the holo terminal. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.